Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, by way of introduction, I've been uh, doing startups for far too long. I'm about to seriously date myself. Um, I got out of grad school, did my first startup in 93. Worked in mobile telephony, and identity is quite important in, through mobile telephony and understanding who an individual is, and went from there to distributing content for Hollywood. And in that context, identity is also very important. Um, <laughs> so, just starting off very high level, this might be a little bit remedial for most of the people in the room, but just to set the level bar, what is identity and are you sure that what you think identity is identity? Who gave you that identity? And your identity isn't a piece of plastic. As you can tell, all three of these are spoofs. They're not actual people. Well, Jerry Seinfeld is, but that's not really his card. <laughs> your identity is really made up of three buckets. Who you are, biometrics, institutional attestations about who you are, so governmental, like a birth certificate or a driver's license, banking, like an ATM card, you know, or a utility bill, uh, or a diploma, which is a school claim that I did something specific. You also have a series of community endorsements, things that the community has said about you. Now, this gets very interesting in a networked world. Things like Airbnb reputation score is directly transferable to VRBO. That information that I have spent five years renting from Airbnb and successfully paying them should be reflected to VRBO when I make my first rental, right? Rental and payment history, so. Um, Everest started from a very specific standpoint that we are creating utility for humanity. By starting at that point, we had to do some very specific things. We decided to start with biometry, the knowledge of the individual, and build up from there. So we start with the biometry of the individual, add in institutional attestations, add in community attestations. Why? Why is this important? Because there are a ton of people that are affected by a lack of identity. There's the 1.1 billion that you've heard repeatedly uh, mentioned that are people that are just unidentified. On top of that, there's another 450 million that were at one point identified, lost their identification card, never had value derived from the identification card, so never bothered to get another one. So those people are effectively in the system but lost. You also have the 2.6 billion people that have no bank account or no access to banking. There's about 375 million people that have no ability to KYC, so they're not able to join the banking. And there's about 5 billion people on the planet without a smartphone. Those 5 billion people on the planet without a smartphone aren't going to be buying one soon. Something like 40% of the world population makes less than $5 a day. You can't blow $500 on a smartphone if you're making $5 a day. This is the magnitude of the impact we're talking about. This is the impact. What you're looking at is the G20 and everybody else. Everybody else is 20% of the world GDP, but that's 40% of our population. Why is that? Because of a simple problem in identity. If you are unable to demonstrate your identity, you're unable to get access to cheap capital. Cheap capital pools in the Western world where identi identity is easily solved and easily resolved. In the frontier markets, the cost of capital can be 10 or 15 times the cost of capital in the Western world. To borrow a million dollars in Jakarta will cost you 20 points. Why? Because you're in Jakarta. That's just that doesn't make any sense, and that's not sustainable, and that should be solved. If we solve the cost of capital problem, we solve a lot of problems downstream. 
people can get access to the capital and can grow an economy. If we can take this 20% of the economy and invigorate it, we might be able to double it. And if you're able to double that $20 trillion to $40 trillion, what's the net impact to that 20% of the world population? It's huge. So these are all of the different effects of an identity gap. The first one I was just talking about, the cost of capital in the frontier market. There's access to aid programs. The World Food Program can't give you food aid unless they know who you are. They are very, very painfully aware of the leakage in their system. They lose 18 to 20 percent of the money when it leaves Geneva or Rome and gets uh, driven out into the world. And that is just to friction in the system. With the distributed ledger technology, you can take that friction in the system out. The capacity for graft goes very remarkably down when everything is on a transparent ledger. Anyone who's cheating gets found very quickly. You lose your social contract, your right to vote, to attend school, to obtain social services. The capacity for a self-sovereign identity to solve a lot of these problems is on the cusp of being uh, realized. And that, to us, is very exciting. Our focus on the frontier world and in bringing an identity to the unidentified has led us to believe that the future of the 21st century economy is an inclusive identity plane. Everyone needs to have an identity to be able to play in the digital world. In the Everest system, you get an identity called an Ever ID, and matched with it, you get a wallet called an Ever Wallet. Why? Because the capacity for an individual in the frontier market to figure out the technology to get a cryptocurrency wallet is very, very low. The ability for them to get a self-sovereign identity on top of a cryptocurrency wallet is also even less. So by marrying these two together, when you're enrolling someone to get an identity, they're automatically in the digital economy. They already have an endpoint that the World Food Program can put vouchers for food aid into. We're taking the 8th century to the 21st century in one step. So this is a transaction with identity platform. The reason I say it that way, not an identity platform with transaction capabilities, is because that's really the focus. We're a transaction system. We create a voucher mechanism to enable almost anything to be digitized and sent through to an individual and biometrically verify that that individual alone was the one that received it. Now, taking a step back to the governance of all of this, this is a key critical component. Who owns their identity? We believe the user should own their identity, and the user alone should own their identity. They should have complete control of everything, including their biometrics. So within our system, we have the EverID and the EverWallet. The EverID rides a specific blockchain, which is operated by the Identity Network Foundation. This is a foundation set up in Switzerland, endowed by Everest, and uh, self-perpetuating because the majority of the funds for verification of identity go directly to the INF. Now, that's critical because my data is parked in a foundation whose sole responsibility it is to protect my data. Now, when you're creating a utility for humanity, you need to consider that there's going to be a lot of people that have no capacity to understand what you're actually doing with their data. Uh, a frontier um, agrarian society member isn't able to conceptualize what you're saying. They're able to conceptualize that I'm, I'm recording your identity and I'm giving you the capacity to interact in a digital world. They're not going to understand the intricacies of how we're recording it, where we're storing it, all of that. It's up to the INF to make sure that their data is protected. Let's 
Sorry, the build's a little funny. Um, so what we're building, or have built, uh, is a platform for all seven billion people on the planet. This is specifically what we're designed to do. We scaled the transaction platform for a stupid number of transactions, basically to be able to scale to consume the entire planet's economy. Well, why do we do that? Because that's the only way that this whole system works. Everyone needs to have an identity. Everyone needs to play in the digital economy. And when you get to the point where everyone is in the economy, you can do wonderful things like solving all of those problems with the identity gap. Okay. The focus on biometrics, I want to come back to very briefly. For our system, we have the capacity to plug in any biometric system. Right now, we use face and fingerprints, and we require at least two forms of biometry. Why do we do that? Deduplication, all the different types of risk that you have in one form of biometry go away when you have a second form. When I can take multiple fingerprints from you, I can do additional verifications of your identity. I can also do things like uh, coercion keys, which is a specific order of digits which tell the system that I am currently under distress and that whatever action that I am currently taking should be nullified. We have the capacity of taking trigger keys. So if I give you a specific order of digits into the system, it can do specific things, like a shortcut. I want to send a remittance to my grandmother in the Philippines. I do this every month. I don't want to sit there and spend 20 minutes configuring this. I just want to go to a shortcut. We can make all of these simple uh, user interface elements elegant by reusing this biometry system. Thank you very much. <laughs>